Good afternoon. Today I'm continuing our mini series with Nancy Pfaff, who is giving us her experiences in Christian individuation. And today we'll be talking about maturity, but let me ask Nancy to just recap the previous uh, sessions that we've done. Go ahead. So our first segment was on a big dream that portended a new identity that was coming where the divine masculine and divine feminine would join together and how absolute evil came up and I gave it form in the form of a shield and dismissed it back to the unconscious. In our next uh, series, we talked about the child and the unconscious, and the numinous for the child. We talked about my personal myth, which I relate to as Persephone, spending six months in the underworld and six months in the light because <laughs> of all the many uh, cycles I've been through, death and rebirth cycles. And so we're going through a lot of these in my individuation. And each one enlarged my consciousness and was necessary for the next stage of growth. And I promised to end the series on a rebirth note. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be good. <laughs> yes. Also, uh, in that segment, I talked about how I became interested in monasticism and how I was miraculously healed through a dream that completely changed my identity and my relationship to the unconscious. Then our last segment was on uh, a rebirth. Uh, I had started a new ministry called Spiritual Direction where I sit with people, listen to them, uh, listen to what's coming up from the unconscious, help them to identify where the life wants to go, what is the invitation of God for them. I don't give it to them, I just help them uncover it. And so that began that ministry, which I'm still doing, and is a great delight. And then we hit into some marriage issues and started the uh, death rebirth cycle again. And there was a divorce and readjustments. And then again, the rebirths. Well, I need to mention the vows that I took in order to try to keep the marriage together when there was no longer a pers an intimate physical relationship, I took religious vows for a year that I wrote they, with the help of uh, the Carmelite nuns here in Reno, uh, uh, my spiritual right. director and various books. And that was uh, trying to sublimate the sexual response, not repress it. And so we talk about sublimation. And uh, let's see, then we start with a rebirth, and the rebirth starts with some mystical experiences. And the one that we were talking about last time, we'll talk about now and again, and that is uh, seeing Jesus, the Sacred Heart, in Sacre Coeur, Paris, the Church of the Sacred Heart a big white domed church on the hill in Paris, perhaps the highest point in Paris. If you've ever been there, you've seen it. So my daughter and I uh, went to France studying art and prayer. And one of the places we visited was Sacre Coeur, the Church of the Sacred Heart. And when you come in to Sacre Coeur, there is a person, a volunteer standing there to have you be in a reverent, hushed demeanor as you go through. It's very different than Notre Dame, which is pretty much a tourist in and out kind of experience. And so I'm in this hushed, reverent atmosphere, and I go around the corner and find this statue. So I come around this statue, and there's no one really nearby. I'm kind of alone with this statue. And the the images of Jesus, the Sacred Heart, that I have seen in the past are very sentimental. Uh, they do not represent a real man. And here I find a real man as the uh, Jesus, the Sacred Heart, and it arrests me. 
And so I stand before it and open my heart to God, opening to the unconscious to see what may emerge. And Jesus steps out of the statue and appears to me as he would have appeared after the resurrection. So he's fully alive. He still has the scars, but he's fully alive. He's a vital man. He's a real man. And I know that his divinity is the fact that he is fully individuated. He is a full, he's living fullness as a human being. And in that fullness, completely individuated, he is expressing the great love of God to me personally, but also to the whole world. And in that love is a compassion for all of us, which understands how hard it is in our lives, all the suffering we go through, all the difficulties we meet. And in that compassion, there is a deep and great respect for us. And this was quite uh, moving for me, very healing for me, because I'd just been through that divorce. And so I began to make my upward uh, tra upward trail to rebirth through having this particular image. And this is an image that particular visionary experience with the statue is still, I still have access to in the unconscious and can go to that at any time. If I need to have a sense of presence of Jesus and I'm in the middle of a difficult situation, I can pull up that, it, that experience and the experience is just as alive in the moment as it was back then in 2002. So I came back from France wanting to join the Carmelite order and it was recommended that I wait three years following the divorce to see if I, that really was what I wanted to do. And so I was really looking forward to this and as I was preparing myself to make an application I had a vision of Jesus saying to me, you are prayer. And the vocation of the Carmelites is prayer. And I thought that was confirmation for me to that I would be joining the Carmelites. And I began to let my imagination run away from me, which I have discovered is a very bad thing to do. Build castles in the air and move into them. I don't know <laughs> into intuitive people are just generally that way so I had myself living at the Carmelites oh boy and uh, in my mind and in my heart and uh, I did put in my application and it was turned down uh -huh. so I started into a descent again into the underworld and we can go to image 24 okay this is the Black Madonna of Czestakowa from Poland. Now this is one of the images. There are many images of the uh, Black Madonna of Czestakowa. The key to recognizing her is the blackness and the slashes on her cheek. Hmm. And the story is that the original image, which I don't believe exists anymore, was uh, taken out of a monastery and slashed by the driver of a particular cart, and he died. Hmm. And so the legend has that with that cutting of the image, he died. And then wow. there's another story related to her that uh, having that image in the monastery maybe a hundred years later, 200 years later, uh, prevented the takeover of the monastery by another nation. And people from Poland make regular pilgrimages all the time to hmm. the image that's there. This is my own personal image. It's a small statue, but there are many representations. What you want to make sure you're getting the right... Uh, Black Madonna are the slashes on the face. I see. And, and so oh, this is a, a statue you have in your home now. I do. Yes, uh -huh. this is in my bedroom. I can see it from my bed when I'm in bed. And the reason this means so much to me is that 
when we are going through painful, very painful times, where something we've wanted so much with all our heart just falls through, and we, we can't even think about the future, we need images like this that represent a suffering face. Uh, I've, I've also in, had uh, Christ with the crown of thorns, just the head, and Christ in agony with the crown of thorns. And the crucifix uh, have all been images that have helped me in times when I'm in close to despair. So during this, after getting the Carmelite no, my God image shattered. And you'll remember me saying my God image shattered around 12 or 13 when a Sunday school teacher uh, said the Bible wasn't true. Hmm. And it takes a long time for a new God image to emerge. So it would be about 11 years that I would be in a, a state uh, without having a God image. Then, of course, the descent started almost immediately by having to deal with marriage issues. Yeah. So that was one period. And then here we are with the, I call it the Carmelite no, bless their hearts, they it wasn't anything about me personally. It was my age and my health history that prevented me from being accepted. Right. But I decided at that point that I could not know God personally. And that I, I held on to just a few things. I held on to the fact that there was a God. There is a God. I held on to that concept. I held on to a concept that God has intent. In other words, whatever God is, is moving towards some kind of a goal. And also that God is good, that the goal that God is intending is a good outcome. But relationship with God is meaningless. This is where I was at this particular time. Uh -huh. Strangely enough, I continued to pray. It's just built into me to come to a higher power and prevent, present my heartaches, my concerns for others. Uh, so that happened. That happens almost on an unconscious level, coming more right. from the child who can still relate to God, but the adult has it, the whole thing has just kind of shattered. And I said to my spiritual director at the time. Every day something hemorrhages away. Trust in the scriptures hemorrhages away. Belief in everything I've known about God hemorrhages away. And over a period of a month or so, there was this hemorrhaging of my faith. And one day I thought I was going to lose my mind. And a voice from the unconscious said, breathe and do the next thing. Well, the next thing was to make a sandwich. <laughs> so... I made a sandwich, and that shifted the energy, and I got on from there. Uh, but I didn't have anyone in my life to help me with this. My spiritual direct director and I had parted ways. Uh, he had gone on to some other things. And so it was very difficult not having a community, mm -hmm. not having my faith, not having relationship with God. It was for me the God of love, the personal God of love, and so this was this was uh, really a dismemberment in the underworld for me, and it had to take uh, just the movement within me unconscious over a period of eleven years before a new God image was born, and I can talk about that later. But what I did uh, during the time that I was in this, you might call it dark night of the soul, was to go into business. And I, <laughs> I had consulted churches as an organizational consultant, so I had that background. I had been trained as a clinical hypnotherapist, and I had that background. I had been trained and practicing as a Reiki master teacher, and I had that, and I had done dream work for many, many years, the union style dream work. And so I offered a combination of all these things, along with spiritual direction, 
and had offices in Reno and Carson and was doing quite well. And uh, so that was a several year period there where I was pretty much marketing my business, advertising, writing articles in local magazines about what I was doing, mm -hmm. and then being in my office and so forth, working with people. <clears throat> Had wonderful, wonderful happenings, outcomes. Uh, one of them that stands out to me was giving Reiki to a woman who had voices that troubled her. Mm. And in the middle of the Reiki treatment, her voices left her and she felt peace for the first time. And there would be, you know, unusual things like that. A truck driver, a woman truck driver who came in uh, with a deep depression and through some clinical hypnotherapy, we traced that back to its origin. And by right. getting to the origin, she uh, was healed of the depression. She knew the source of it. Something in that, finding the source of that, which went back to a very young child, three or four years old. Through a number of years then, I was on my own. I had a lovely apartment, a duplex uh, with two bedrooms. I could have my grandson over to mm -hmm. spend the night. And I had my business to work with. And I had joined a networking group among, with business leaders in the town. And I made new friendships. And so I was doing okay. And then we start into another cycle of descent. And in 2008, nobody wanted alternative means of healing. They were spending their money on food and electricity and just getting by. And so in 2008, in the matter of about two or three months, there was no business. Mm -hmm. And I had to buy out con my advertising contract and printing contract and different things like that right. and uh, that, that was the crash of 2008 yes nobody had yes. any money right right okay so uh but i had that experience which is a wonderful experience very validating to me as a person who had spent many years ill that i could come back and meet with the public and actually do some good in the world Uh, the rebirth followed fairly quickly after this descent. So it was a, you know, one of these great dips like the stock market mm -hmm. and then coming back up because uh, when I was helping my teacher who had taught me clinical hypnosis, she was going to be gone for one of her sessions. And so she asked me to teach it for her. Mm -hmm. And I met this lovely man. Oh, boy. <laughs> and, and he had a twinkle in his eye, beautiful blue eyes. And so I was 68 and falling in love. Oh my goodness. And this was, <laughs> this was a great rebirth. And we really enjoyed each other's company tremendously. There was no problem with physical intimacy in this relationship. Mm -hmm. So although it had been a long spell of dryness in that regard, this was just delightful. Mm -hmm. And things went along beautifully for a couple of years. And I remember feeling a little bored because things were going so well. <laughs> well, I didn't have that, to work. That's the first sign of danger. <laughs> I know. I know. And so that was a signal yeah. of trouble on its way. And so two years into our relationship, uh, he lived on a ranch about 45 miles north of Reno, and we would get together for half the week. And half the week, he'd be out at the ranch, and I got a trailer to put on his property, so then I could go out to the ranch and be out there. Uh, and so two years into our relationship, he mentioned to me, uh, Doyle is where he lived. Mm -hmm. He said Do the weather prediction for Doyle is extremely high fire danger today and within about 30 minutes we got a phone call from his son that lightning had struck the hill just behind the house and fire was racing down the hillside oh my gosh so he took off 
And I put some things together to bring out because we wouldn't be able to stay in the house or the trailer. And I found a little motel there in Doyle and set up shop for Lee and I and his son. And later went over, we had to, I had to go through a different route to get as close to where he was. We could call each other on our cell phones. And so that night we spent hearing um, propane tanks exploding. We didn't oh know whether everything was lost on the ranch. Uh, they had a number of cats that they took care of. A lot of people left off their feral cats or other mm -hmm. cats. We just had no idea. And that night we just held each other in this very simple motel room. And in the morning, we were able to go back to where the fire, where the firefighters had their center. And someone went out to take a look and said that the house was standing, the cars were there, the trailer was there. But much had been burned. All the outbuildings, the barn was gone, the shop to fix the equipment on the ranch was burned. Uh, so much equipment was lost, at least $150,000 worth of damage. Wow. And that that was really a great heartache for all of us, for Leah's son and myself. And we didn't quite recover from that. We did our best. Uh, but a symbol of that time for me was the cottonwood tree by the, uh, he had a steel building there that survived the fire that they also repaired equipment in. And a cottonwood tree just behind that the leaves had been, uh, this was in the summer, in July, mm -hmm. and the leaves had been turned to paper, kind of a brownish paper-like wow. substance, mm -hmm. and rustling in the wind, and black ash everywhere. Uh, so it was, you know, a great disheartening for all of us. But we, we had a lot to do to repair and and get back on track and the work itself was what saved us uh, and each other having each other to, yeah. to talk to and listen to so we did quite well for another several years and then Lee was diagnosed with a terminal illness and mm -hmm. given four to five years to live and I was thrust into a great inner conflict between life and death until you face death up close through a loved one mm -hmm. or your own diagnosis. You don't have to come to terms with the fact that you are a limited commodity, that there is a date stamped on your forehead. Right. <laughs> so I had this great inner conflict going on uh, adjusting to the fact that I would lose him much sooner than I had hoped and that I myself was mortal and I, I this went this became kind of a, a a lot of work with the unconscious a lot of work with all the complexes were energized all the the uh, grief from past losses came up and so I, I had a counselor helping me and a spiritual director helping me. I've always been able to ask for help in extreme crisis. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> now I know how to ask for help before it becomes an extreme crisis. Well, that's, that's, good. <laughs> that's, that's growth. That's good. But um, his dying was very difficult because he broke off the relationship. Uh, at a certain point and didn't want any further contact. Mm. And so I couldn't get any real information. And one day I saw on his Facebook that his nephews and nieces were praying for him. Mm -hmm. And I was able to get hold of a younger, uh, one, the youngest adult child. And mm -hmm. she told me this story that he'd been hospitalized and was in critical care and had been moved up to Chico to be with his uh, other daughter up there where she could handle all the ins and outs of this situation. Mm 
But there was no further contact with the family. And when I tried to get in touch with Lee, uh, I was told that he didn't, not by him, but I was told he didn't want anything to do with me, which was extremely difficult. Oh, bad. And uh, so <clears throat> what I, I had some encouragement during that period. And I, I like Robert A. Johnson's term, the slender threads or synchronicity that give you some inspiration or some guidance. This image is just a, a watercolor sketch to remind me of something amazing that happened that encouraged me again, that said again, I'm connected to a higher power and miracles are possible. So I'm in the basement of this Episcopal church. I'm in the bathroom. I'm in a stall and I look down and I see the drain for the bathroom and coming up out of that drain is this little sprout wow. now how did a seed get into that place and <laughs> how did it ever get enough light because the light in the bathroom are these low frosted glass windows and they're small windows like you have in the basement and how the light could have sh shown just exactly right on that particular because you see the shadow of the stall covers most of that drain Right, but it, so it, is the is the stall lighted with fluorescent light? Yes. Okay, that's where it got the light. Well, it's only light lit when people are in there. Yeah, but that's it not goes different. it automatically goes dark when you leave. Yeah, it's but probably the chances, not. <laughs> the probability of this happening is right. very low. Oh yes, I agree with you entirely. And. Uh, now, I could have just said, well, isn't that interesting, and pulled it out and thrown it away because it shouldn't be there. Or mm -hmm. I can open to the remarkable nature of the world in which we live <laughs> and, and to the power within us, the greater power that we uh, are connected to. And I can say, this was meant for me today because I feel this upswelling of of." Uh, enlargement of hope uh, that something is coming that's going to be good yeah. you know I'm miserable now but at my lowest moments these kinds of things are there and it simply takes eyes to see it takes a choice to see as a child would see right. not to just be rational about it but to let the magic of this world the magic of life touch us Right. And have a readiness. I, when doc, Dr. Jung always spoke of, about synchronicity, that within that there's a readiness to see. And so you already have a pre, you're already predisposed unconsciously maybe to um, receive something and then it appears. I'm, I'm glad you said that. I love that. Yeah. So during this whole process of Lee's dying, the chronic fatigue syndrome that was healed in a miracle in 1995 returned. Mm -hmm. So now I'm dealing with this, what they call complicated grief over Lee's death. I wasn't there with him. We didn't go through it together. There was a break in the relationship off before his death. And I want anyone to know if they have a complicated grief, they need professional help without a doubt, mm -hmm. because it is just, uh, it, it just disrupts the, your inner world so dramatically right. that you may not want to live, and yet you really do want to live. Sure. And so during this <clears throat> time where Lee was not, he had not yet died, but we were no longer in touch. I began to go through this defeat and lamentation period. And what I found is that if one will do a meaningful ritual, that this will help integrate that. It will decrease the suffering and right. give meaning and make sacred the suffering. This is a very powerful image, actually. Uh, this was coming up from the unconscious. It's called the third burning. This was, uh, is it May 22nd, 2017 at 7.30 a.m. So I'm right. up in the morning just in terrible grief. 
and despair, but there is sunshine down to the right-hand corner there that uh, I'm believing that God is with me and that healing and restoration will come. And I call this the rendered heart. And I want to share the ritual that went with this painting and I did a series of these paintings at this time because it was a way to give form to the inner despair Mm -hmm. so that way you have consciousness sharing the burden of the unconscious because all those deep emotions are attached to complexes and if consciousness isn't involved with the unconscious we suffer much greater and so Uh, Ritual, I want to say just a little bit about ritual. Ritual uh, uses symbols. If if you have a meaningful ritual, you have symbols that are meaningful to you. And what I did, because I had the labyrinth and I had a fire pit, and I was not going to get any of Lee's ashes I made my own ashes because I still had some of his clothes. Mm -hmm. And so periodically when the despair reached a a great level, I would do a burning of the clothes. Uh And I would put the fire pit in the middle of the labyrinth and and light the fire. First time I did it, there was a tree above me and I almost burned down the yard and the house. (laughs) So we went to the center of the labyrinth. And as, as I would walk around the labyrinth, I would walk counterclockwise, accepting, for helping consciousness accept the fact that this relationship was over, uh-huh. that death was a reality. And one particular morning, I had on my, I was using my cell phone, I'm a modern ritualist, so I had my cell phone, and I looked up, uh, Let's see if I've got the, the, uh, there is a season by Pete Seeger, who was a famous folk singer in the 60s. Sure. And it's singing out of the scripture of Ecclesiastes, there is a time for everything under heaven. Right. A time to be born and a time to die. And so I was playing that. There was a gentle rain falling. It was as if God was weeping with me. I let my imagination take me. Uh, in these kinds of rituals. And I was listening to Pete Seeger sing through the different seasons of our lives, walking counterclockwise in the gentle rain. And towards the end of that song, and you can still get it on your on your phone or whatever. Oh, I have it. <laughs> Do you? <laughs> oh, yeah. Pete Seeger was one of my favorites, too. You and so, I are almost of an age. so <laughs> Yeah, we're close. Uh, And so at the end of this particular recording, the whole audience begins to sing. Mm -hmm. There is a time, 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 time. There is a season, 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 season for everything. I can't remember all the words under heaven. And as this whole audience is singing, I am being witnessed. My grief is being witnessed by hundreds of people. Mm -hmm. who are mortal and who have lost loved ones. I mean, this is my imagination, just going with whatever the unconscious is bringing, just letting it carry my my unconscious. It works incredibly well. And it was a very, very healing experience. So I encourage others to uh, develop their own meaningful rituals, especially around strong feeling, around strong and powerful events in life that change your course in life because it does decrease the suffering. It does integrate conscious and unconscious. Hmm. And uh, you can do it frequently throughout the day. You can do this. It can be as simple as lighting a candle or making the sign of a cross or standing below your favorite tree or sitting on a rock. Uh, but any kind of meaningful ritual that connects you with that event mm-hmm. will be healing. I've done many, but we're not going to go into some of the other ones. Just I just wanted people to have that that Idea. knowledge. Yeah. And uh, a symbol can also be 
I wanted to differentiate between a sign and a symbol. Now a stop sign is a sign, that's all it is. It doesn't have any echoes, it doesn't have any further meaning. It stops right there, it's a sign. Yeah. But if you take the American flag, you can come to the American flag as a sign, that means the United States of America, or you can come to it as a symbol, which represents the blood of all those who have died for our country. And I think in our own country, those that are outraged by the burning of the flag are coming to it as symbol. And those that are burning it are coming to it as sign. And I, I can't say that for sure, but that's kind of my impression. Well, if they're, unless they're against the symbol, I, um, you know, it happens to be one of the symbols that uh, is dear, dear to me. And um, it, symbolically represents so much more I can't even begin to say. I mean, there, there are so many di dimensions to it. Right. And, um, and so it's not, it's not just about identifying the country or identifying someone's nationality. It's a, as you say, it's about it's symbolic of the blood of those that have given their lives. But, um, you know, for me, it's symbolic of my 23 years of service in the Marine Corps. So, um, you know, by, yeah. and it's symbolic of the five men I know who gave their lives for the country. So, yeah. um, you know, it's not only their blood, but my entire relationship with those men right. and my entire relationship with the Marine Corps, for example. Yeah. Um, and so, I mean, in that sense, when I see the American flag, all those things come to my mind. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just, uh, I can't even begin to say it. I mean, when, when we do our evening colors at the Annapolis Shot Club every evening at sunset and everybody in the club when sunset is announced we have a small pa system in the club so uh, you know evening colors is announced and everybody stands and faces the flag and puts their hand on their heart if they're american and as they're playing the bugle call it's just it just touches me so deeply and very often I end up in tears uh, during the bugle call because I think of the five men I personally know who um, made those sacrifices. And in one case, it's actually the son of a fraternity brother of mine, but that it's also symbolic of that fraternity brother who um, left college early went off in the army and um, was very, very severely wounded in battle. And um, and that family has suffered very much over the years. And yes. so it's symbolic of that. I mean, I could, I could roll out things that are, anchored to the american flag in my psyche all yes. afternoon right that, that's you're giving such an excellent illustration of symbol a symbol has echoes goes deep right and you've given such a beautiful example of that yeah and that's a ritual maybe it isn't one you intend but it must happen every so often that you're there at sunset. Oh, surely we intend it. Oh, you do intend it. Then of you have course. you have a wonderful ritual then of remembrance. Of course we intend it. I mean, this is Annapolis, Maryland, which is the home home of the U.S. <laughs> Naval Academy. So, so uh, you know, evening colors on any military base in the United States. Um, anywhere in the country, if you happen to be on a military base at evening colors, you'll, mm -hmm. you'll hear the bugle call or you'll hear a 
cans report or something and then yes. all the traffic stops and yes. everyone that is in uniform gets out of their car and salutes the flag yes during morning and evening color so these are rituals we very definitely intend and and they're um, alive <laughs> very much so yeah absolutely absolutely so anyway but this is your story all right <laughs> so all right we, we can we, we can take the images down for a moment okay another uh, thing i did um i don't know how to do this without getting a light on it but i made a ceramic box this is i studied um cultural anthropology as a minor in college. Uh -huh. I particularly liked the images of the Northwest Coast Indians. And they would have these treasure boxes. Mm -hmm. They were made of wood. And I didn't have the opportunity to do that. Mm -hmm. But I made my own. And there are four faces. And so I used this to put the ashes in that I had made from Lee's clothes. Mm -hmm. And on the inside lid, there is a necklace, a pendant of a necklace that ha comes in two parts so that if you have a girlfriend or boyfriend or spouse, a partner, one wears one half of this and one wears the other half. And it's um, the Lord watch between me and me while we are absent one from another. It's wonderful. Yeah. And the last thing that I put in the box was soil from the ranch. Uh -huh. And so uh, this sits in my hallway, my entry hallway, where I have a number of artifacts. And is very meaningful to me. If I want to, I can reach out and touch it. I did save one outfit of his, not to be burned. And on the anniversary of his death this year, 2019, I laid out his jeans on the couch as if he was sitting there and his shirt up against the back of the couch. And then I sat in his lap and mm. just put the sleeve of this shirt across my chest and just sat there. And it just seemed that it, the love we had shared oh, was right there. So having that ritual, I couldn't <clears throat> do it until this year. This year was the second year after his death. Mm -hmm. But this year, it was a wonderful memorial. I put flowers out in the Zen garden and uh, really made it a day of remembrance. And so mm -hmm. ritual, when it's meaningful, can be so helpful. This is a statue of Hildegard of Bingen. And I can't pronounce the name of the town in Germany. But this is a statue a friend of mine visited there just a few months ago. Mm -hmm. and. I have a little book of hers that is an easy read, and it's called The Journal of Hildegard of Bingen. I, I had made a decision to do a re personal retreat every Saturday, which meant taking an hour with that book and to just be present to her words and to see what they came up for me. Mm -hmm. And in one of the writings, she was talking about ashes, and the word ashes just grabbed me. I didn't know exactly why, but I started to pray and I said, Jesus, I'm nothing but ashes. And that's how I felt. I felt very insubstantial in this deep grief and deep illness together. And I had a little vision, uh, an interior vision. And in the vision, there's this pile of ashes, which represent myself in deep despair and deep illness. And Jesus reaches over and takes some of those ashes and makes a cross on his forehead. And when he did that, it made this suffering sacred for me. Mm. And that, began, that was a seed then that the unconscious could continue to process and unfold within me in the darkness where I wasn't even aware of it. But mm -hmm. it started an upward movement in my spirit. Mm. And then we can go to image 29. And this came about the same time. This is a sunflower. And I call it Mary Magdalene because I was in an online class with Mirabai Starr, who's an interfaith leader. 
and she had us going through a course on the goddesses. And she said, you know, pick any female figure, living or dead, that you would want to relate to and talk to them. And so when I came to meditation the next morning, I sat quietly, and Mary Magdalene came forth. And I said to her, I can't serve God anymore. You know, with the grief and the illness, I'm just a lump on a log. And she said to me, turn your face to Jesus throughout the day, like the sunflower follows the sun. Mm -hmm. And that reminded me of that incident I shared in an earlier portion of our conversation, where I had an image of Jesus in the Sunday school room with toddlers. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, isn't it okay if I just have some of my children with me? Meaning that some of us are called to a quiet, contemplative life. I think Robert A. Johnson was told by Carl Jung that all because he lived close to the un, the collective unconscious, all he had to do was live and breathe, and the unconscious would take care of him. And so that's the kind of life that I've been living since then. Mm -hmm. And uh, but this was one of those mystical experiences that helped me out of the despair, helped me out of the the uh, the grief and the illness, the losses, the tremendous number of losses that had piled up. And we need these inspirations in these times, and they are there for us in the unconscious if we pay attention to our dreams, right. if we're open to other forms of spiritual disciplines, the uh, unconscious can bring forth life for us to help us survive these difficult times. Right. Now we're starting into my current period, which I call maturity part two, and I'm 76 years old. This is a collage I did. I'm sorry for the reflections in it. Uh, but for me, this was, I was being torn between the opposites of life and death. And we see here a replication of the uh, the Christian church in the lower portion there, you see kind of a, a figure that is very, it's not a living figure. It's old, mm. it doesn't have any life to it. And then you see up above a figure that has been wounded and torn apart by the opposites. And of course, Christ on the cross is an image of being torn apart by the opposites. Right. And then, but there is a halo. There is that sense of rebirth. There is that promise right. of rebirth. And for me, during this time, this was this was a feeling I was trying to present that included my faith, the lost faith, the the new God image emerging, which had a lot more Jungian psychology involved. Right. And the the reality of the opposites and when you're in the conflict between them it is a crucifixion <laughs> it is terribly painful obviously yes i agree entirely and working with our shadow that side of ourself that contains memories that we're embarrassed about or par parts of our identity that we're embarrassed about and parts of us that if we were to take responsibility for them could make us into a much bigger person making a much bigger contribution in the world, but it's too scary for us. Those are in the shadow as well. <laughs> yeah. But working with the shadow is so terribly important. Uh, and I can't remember who has said this. Uh, one of Jung's disciples or he, he himself, maybe Marie Louise von Franz somewhere says, it's too hard to face your shadow without someone who can hold what's coming up and help you with it and right. present to you that you are accepted in your most unlovable places. In integrating the shadow, we again are much larger personality, much able to to 
contribute to our world in a much more substantial way right to be happier more fulfilled and to be able to love what i've discovered in this last year is that my rejection of evil uh which i'll talk a little bit more later the re rejection of evil in myself letting the christian story say you know jesus died for my sins I no longer carry that burden. So I don't have any more evil. I mean, that's not true. That's not a correct interpretation of that scripture. But that was how I was living my life. Mm -hmm. And so facing my own evil, the hurt that I had done my ch adult children, the mistakes I'd made in relationships, for me, being a woman, relationships are so important. Sure. That... Uh, dealing with the shadow and relationships for me has been extremely important but that has opened up relationships my acceptance of that but i could not have done that i could not have faced my own evil had i not done a lot of interior work and had the knowledge of god's love for me in my most uh, ugly places i could not have faced my own evil so i think it does take maturity to be able to come to terms with that I want to say something to those who, who find Christianity has no life in it for them. And yet, if they have been raised as a Christian, the images are in the psyche and can be numinous and healing if recontacted. But in order to let Christianity come alive again, there are certain things one can do most important thing is to begin to notice what Ignatius of Loyola called inner movements. Mm -hmm. So like when I saw that tulip in the labyrinth, there was an inner movement of me towards life, an inner movement towards me of an openness beginning to happen. And whenever that kind of thing happens, you're on the right track. You can follow that. So and if you're so oh, luminous ahead. experiences are, are what you're talking about. Well, I'm talking about a very subtle mm -hmm. sense within yourself. Numinous comes, in my mind, numinous comes in a variety of strengths. So this would be, uh, you'd have to be paying attention to that opening within yourself and that closing off within yourself to be able to get those inner movements. Right. Um, well, my, my observation of late, as I've been working toward my talk on the living God, is that I have religious experiences all the time. And I think you're, you're right that it, they come in various strengths, from knock your socks off to, you know, something very subtle talking to you, like... Well, I wanted to mention, if, the, if they wanted to go back to church, the thing to do would be to go in, not paying a lot of attention to the sermon or the, the homily, uh, maybe even the scripture readings, not, not going in to try to understand that, but going in expecting a luminous experience, probably very subtle. Mm -hmm. Because I can be sit, I can remember during that period when I was estranged from God, going into a church service, and it was just nothing to me. But all of a sudden, a thought came to me that had nothing to do with what was going on around me. Right. But it was a thought that was healing, and it was a thought for the day to hold on to that I really needed. And so, if we take that part of ourselves in, and recognize we are psyche and body, right? and that the deeper self can speak to us in these holy places, something yeah. will happen within us. That's and it right. may or may not be related to the dogma, the doctrine, the ritual, or whatever. On the other hand, uh, I was in church one day, this is a Catholic church before I was a Catholic, and it was St. Blaise's day. And St. Blaise, they have a blessing of throats. And I happen to have a sore throat. Mm -hmm. 
So I let my imagination flow with that synchronicity that I was there on St. Blaise's Day. He was a healer of sore throats, and I had one. And I went up for them to pray for me, and I walked out without a sore throat. Wow. Uh, so one never knows what's going to happen. When, and, and you well, we don't this. know what, how, how our psyche really works. That, um, you know, sometimes things are, someone would call, a rationalist would call it psychosomatic, but if it, if it is psychosomatic, then it is curable by things that are done in religious ceremony occasionally so you know sometimes and and one way of dealing with it i mean dr edinger talked about prayer being a petition to your unconscious to your god image to yourself um to take care of us in one way or another and if you think of the prayer as a petition on your behalf to your own unconscious, maybe your own unconscious can heal the problem. <laughs> and again, and, and that's where God is too. That's right. And I think that openness, like I said, if we live our lives with that openness, whether we're in a church or in a grove of redwoods or, or just in our business office, uh, we have to stay somewhat closed when we're in the world uh, because of all the things that can come in, but still to keep at least one ear open, one eye open towards God coming to us, toward the self erupting into consciousness True. in a personal way that's going to be of great benefit to us. Right. Because there was no relationship, I no longer believed or had faith for or was experiencing uh, a relationship with when I was not accepted into the now this is a big psychological thing so I don't know yeah. how far to go with this right. but basically I was so disheartened by not becoming a member of the Carmelites I see yeah and the fact that I had heard that word within my deepest self, you are prayer, and that the Carmelite's vocation is prayer. And I was now not going to be able to be in the Carmelites to develop this oneness with Christ that I had experienced. You experienced a trauma because of that. Yes, that was right. very traumatic. Okay. I, and, yeah. All right, I see. And so that can cause you to lose the connection with God. Right. Yes. Right. And, yes. and so it's best to build up a strong relationship. And, you know, what I do, and this may not be terribly easy for most people, but because I'm so intuitive, uh, I, things come to my mind all the time. And I, I take them as presented by God. Okay, or the God image, or however you want to say it, but yes. they come from the unconscious and from the psyche. And so, when something is happening in my life, I've seen, I've probably seen, I don't know, two or three thousand movies in my lifetime. And of course, we use movies to educate the young these days. And so, I've seen many, many movies. And very, very often, I would say five times a day, probably, um, something will happen and it will cause a movie scene to pop up in my mind, complete with dialogue. I remember exactly what the words were, mm -hmm. right? And um, Is it meaningful to you when that happens? I absolutely. Mean, that's Yes. That's a message from, from God telling me, pay attention to this. This is, yes. this is something that I've stored here for you. And now, now it's here and it has meaning for you right now. And that's why I'm giving it to you right now. Yes. That's why I'm ca causing this experience to come to you. Yes. And that's so important. I mean, there was the tulip in the labyrinth and, and, so, and the sprout in the uh, basement. 
those were outward things, but you're right. speaking of inward things, thoughts, intuitions. Right. And it, it's because there is this intent within each one of us. We each have this small divine sliver within us, and we can all make our own decision about whether, you know, this is a, a good spirit or a bad spirit that's coming up. Yes. Think of this sliver as the image of God. And of course, in Genesis, it says that we are made in the image of God. Truly. And that uh, what I'm starting, well, this is next time I should say that. But I think within each of us, if we understood this image of God to be the deeper self, our psyche, uh, the progression towards wholeness, that it, it, it's working whether we know it's there or not. Precisely. Now, it makes a big difference if we tap into it and cooperate with it. Right. Let it take us and, where and have we need faith to go. that it have faith that it will take us. And yes. Will, and I will. think my you know, having faith in a God of love, a personal God of love has helped me tremendously to withstand the the blows and arrows and so forth of life sure. knowing that 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 love is in my corner and it's within me yeah okay so thank okay. you very much thank you're you welcome very much. thank you very much this is wonderful being able to to share a, a real example of trying to live a christian life with jungian uh psychology it's terrific. Right? i think i really am very grateful to you for participating in this project. I think it's extremely important, as you already know.